Michael Nielsen is a 19-year-old man who moved into my neighborhood when he was around 10. Another nice Jewish kid like myself in the same area. We became friends after a month or two, and I was a year academically ahead. When I say he was a nice, innocent kid, I mean it. From late elementary school years into high school, Michael was one of my best friends. Unlike myself, he had success with dating in high school. He was the one I could look to for advice. Michael, in his junior year, began dating a girl named Ariana, and they were together for about a year and a half. Like most high school relationships, they think it'll last forever. They were solid as a relationship. There was no doubt in my mind or others, to even themselves, everything was pretty smooth sailing. Senior year, something drastic occurred in their relationship, something no one had much knowledge about at the time. What had occurred was that Ariana's parents both were deported back to Mexico. Within a night, she had to leave her house in the northern Los Angeles area and move in with her cousins in San Diego to be close with her parents, who now try to live in Tijuana nearby. Her relationship with Michael overnight was over. How at his age could someone cope with something of this sort? I, until college, had never been in a relationship, so I was in no position to understand the pain this has on someone. For Michael, he started smoking weed about a month or two before this event occurred. In the early days, when he was still mulling the loss, he began to smoke much more, a great deal more than me. During this time, Michael and I began to separate slightly as friends. Since he would spend most of his day trying to get high and have smoke sessions with other people every night. Where I was much more focused on school and couldn't focus much if I did the same. In the following months, you could tell his loneliness was at its highest yet. He couldn't go a night without smoking, and when he smoked, he smoked until he would nearly pass out. It was beginning, it was becoming much harder to want to hang out with him. And it was very sad, yes, but it was to the point where there wasn't Michael without weed. He was addicted, addicted to the lack of control from my perspective at the time. I assumed at the beginning he was just addicted to getting high, but what the truth we later found out was that he would smoke that much to take the pain of his loneliness away. It did not become alarming and worrisome until weed could cut it. It did not supply him the high that he wanted. What Michael moved on to was LSD. We all know someone from our high school that uses psychedelics. For Michael, this was the beginning of something that he should have never gotten involved in. The addictive mentality he had with weed carried over easily to his new obsession with LSD and later mushrooms. Most times he would do it, he would consume it with friends. And what we didn't know is that he would do it by himself as well. It was most likely around this time, Michael was most alone and felt no special connections with anyone. No one he believed could understand the pain he was going through, and he would never reach out to me. Marijuana, to me, was the line. I was not doing anything more. This is where our friendship parted. We could still talk, but it was never the same. One night, Michael made the worst decision of his life. He misjudged his tolerance, and he decided to take a total of six tabs of acid, which is six times as much as anyone should ever take. Now it is true you cannot physically overdose on LSD, but Michael had mentally overdosed, and he was found by his parents not moving. Sent to the hospital, this was supposed to be the wake-up call that turned his life around, but the aftermath of his decision was far graver. None of, his, none of his friends, including me, were able to contact him during this time. We only later found out what happened and why he was not around. When he finally came home, Michael had become permafried, which means he constantly feels like he is under the influence of the psychedelic drug. We were not aware of this until we spoke to him for the first time. His friends and I noticed that he was a little off, and it took about a week to conclude that he would not be the same person he was before. He couldn't articulate his words, would space off mid-conversation, he was quite slow, and worst of all, he couldn't recognize people unless he made proper eye contact, since he was constantly hallucinating. His parents were not capable money-wise to put him through therapy, and he seemed to lose most and almost all of his friends because he was extremely hard to talk to and be around. This could only have made his sense of loneliness much worse. He began to use weed and psychedelics in his current mental state again. Since leaving for school last semester, I found out that he was arrested for possession and being under the influence of substances, all while being in the car with an armed drug dealer. Again, not the news I was hoping for him.
His life has turned for the worse from a stupid decision to use substances instead of asking for help. Michael and what occurred has affected me in many ways. I lost a friend to addiction and loneliness. He decided to push his mental state further away from help. Occurrences as such are why I take my own and other people's mental health much more seriously. I have lost a couple of friends, as so many others have as well. I never thought I would lose someone like this.